Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner, co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Our forums are free and open to the public and occur most Sundays at noon. We encourage you to attend. For more information about our forums, you can go to www.austinuu.org. Our mission is to nurture the mind and the spirit and serve social justice. And today, Richard Halpin will be introducing our speaker, Chris Searles. Richard? Thank you, Bonnie. Welcome, everyone. Happy New Year. I'm uh, privileged to introduce to you a gentleman who has um, been an extraordinary ally with our church and our Green Sanctuary Committee and our Faith Across the City Energy Action Team. Chris Searles is founder of the Green Business Good Common Sense and the Outdoor Green Living Festival Sustainable Shoppers Ball and a founding board member of Austin's Interfaith Environmental Network. Chris also serves on the board of Tree Folks and has successfully led initiatives to increase transparency and clean energy investments for the city of Austin's electric utility, Austin Energy. In 2014, Chris founded BioIntegrity. The company's mission is to help today's most powerful global environmental solutions succeed as fast as possible. Additionally, Chris works from time to time as a professional drummer, performing locally and with musicians like Sean Coven, John Prine, and Bruce Springsteen. We are glad to welcome Chris here today to talk about how each of us can significantly contribute to solving both climate change and the species extinction crisis by protecting biocritical ecosystems. Would you put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Chris Searles. Um, I only played with Springsteen one, one time. It was not a big deal, but people like to see that. Um, well, I'm, hey Al, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty nervous to be here because, um, usually I'm nervous just to speak in front of people like most people, but, but today it's actually, uh, I'm more comfortable with that. It's because this community, um, is actually really meaningful to me. And I came here last Sunday for the first time, um, and the, Worship service, a couple of the outstanding things about it to me. Um, the worship service was male and female homilies. So there was a real balance of perspective that I'm not used to seeing in a, in a sacred setting. And then the, the focus was on the mission statement. And, um, and the first part of it, we gather in community. So the theme was all about community that day. And what I'm working on, excuse me, with uh, biointegrity is actually the same thing. Um, the, the idea that, that we're at a sort of a global turning point. And um, we need to, um, the vanguard of altruism is to embrace community. And so um, we, one of the things we were talking about before we started um, is how important this type of setting is and this, this construct is of the forum. Um, because when it, in terms of talking about big global environmental issues, which is my, my cup of tea, you know, most people um, outside of this room are, are very intimidated by those kinds of conversations. And... Um, there's a, there's a great uh, leader um, in the sort of political movement in the, on the climate change side named Naomi Klein, uh, some of you probably are very familiar with. And Naomi talks about the idea that we need uh, these kind of community forums to have discussions about the big challenges of today, the ones that are here now that we all sort of go to sleep uh, trying not to think about and so forth. And that's because the languages of the, uh, climate change in particular are fairly exclusive. There's scientific language, and then there's policy language, and then there's advocates like me that are saying, you know, go faster. And uh, so we need more of this engagement. All that is to say that um, as I go through, I've got, um, I've got the ability to talk about this for like hours and hours, but I've, I've got probably a good 30 minutes of information. But I'd love it if hands came up and we sort of collaborated throughout this presentation um, <clears throat> because in the last three times I've given it, um, it's been one-on-one, -on -one, and instead of trying to put together this very slick, you know, 120 slide presentation, uh, yes. Okay, well that's fine. Um, but I will try to speak to you in the same way I've spoken in these one-on-one -on -one, uh, gatherings, where maybe things move a little faster um, and are, are more informal. 
uh, so we can hopefully kind of relax and, and think about these things together. Um, and also the presentations are in different pieces, uh, so there'll be some pauses as I go through this stuff. Um, one last sort of introductory point also is uh, a, a note of real gratitude, uh, not just to what this community is about, uh, but also to Dale and Pat, who I have admired for a decade or more, um, as is true for every Austin environmentalist, uh, and to Richard and Becky, um, who uh, just do so much amazing work, and, and Richard is uh, a real pioneer um, with American Youth Works and, and truly great things, and, and he's truly humble um, about his incredible accomplishment for the, the betterment of our world. Um, and, uh, and the green team here and all kinds of things. There's just a lot about this place that I'm excited about, and hopefully I'll calm down in just a second. Okay, so this presentation uh, is called Protecting Life. Um, it's also called, in uh, sacred and religious uh, settings, it's also called Protecting the Creator's Works. Um, you know, to me, that's essentially the same idea. I was raised uh, in First Baptist Church here in Austin. Um, my father was a minister his entire life. Um, and so, to me... Um, Life itself uh, offers the possibility of, of sacred relationship. Uh, and I mean that in every sense, psychologically, spiritually, and so forth. Um, and we're also at this moment where um, our best opportunity for solving our global environmental issues is literally to protect life, literally to protect the creator's works themselves. So my story with this project is that um, I began after 10 years of kind of working night and day uh, on environmental issues and being, you know, very passionate, very excited and relatively successful in some things. Um, like everyone, I knew we weren't still going fast enough to solve things like climate change. Uh, and I also started reading up on the extinction crisis, which is getting no coverage. Uh, and as an environmentalist, I'd always uh, heard that the extinction crisis was driven by climate change. And then I started looking more into the, the extinction crisis because the, the little bit of trickles of information I was getting were just, you know, calamitous. It's like, this is way worse than climate change right now. And my environmentalist community, we're not even talking about it. And so I, I decided I wanted to know um, what's the number one most impactful environmental solution on Earth? What's the thing that would do the most um, for climate change? What's the thing that would do the most for species loss and extinctions? What's the one thing we can, we can each do or a company can do that means the most uh, per dollar invested. Um, because to me, it's, we're, we're at a time where we need to be doing a lot more. Um, and it turns out that the answer um, is protecting ecosystems. Uh, there's a couple of good reasons for that. The ecosystems themselves on our planet have been dramatically reduced in the last 45 years uh, in terms of their total vitality. Uh, and also, um, they're our life support system. And also, the, uh, the ecosystems that are disappearing the fastest are um, they're all in one region and they have the greatest amount of biodiversity and they're a critical part of the climate solution as well. So I'm going to show you those things today. Um, I wanted to know the answer to that question. The other thing was I was tired of people not feeling this way about the future of life on Earth um, a year ago. And so this is a photo from a picnic that I produced over at um, First Baptist Church with my green team friends there. And I love this photo because, you know, they're so excited about where they're going. It's just about being in, in the moment and, and the potential for great things is, is in front of them. Uh, and, and clearly, um, our culture is not there at the moment, and we're divided in all kinds of ways. But these are the kinds of feelings that I want to try and create uh, with this project, is that we're going forward, uh, we're turning the ship uh, away from the most uh, serious environmental crisis in all of human history, uh, and we're working together to do it. We're collaborating, we're creating more community, um, more of a shared identity. All these kinds of things that you see on the mission statement on the wall here. Okay, so in terms of ecosystems, um, the first thing to know, in terms of what I have to share with you, is that forests uh, on terrestrial ecosystems, land-based ecosystems, forests are the most biodiverse. So... In a single acre of forest soil, there can be as many as 100,000 unique species of microbiota. Um, and you keep going up the, the sort of vertically from there. Um, there are larger microbiota than there's uh, plant life, than there's uh, insect life, than there's amphibians and 
uh, freshwater fish and waterfowl if there's water, um, which is rare here, but other forests, water's constant. Um, and then there are rodents and reptiles, and large and small mammals, uh, and then, of course, in the trees, an incredible diversity of bird life. Um, ecosystems, other than forests, don't have as many resources for the other species. I, I tend to think of it as um, biodiversity as just sort of a category. is very much similar to us. They enjoy shelter. Uh, species of all types enjoy shelter uh, and enjoy uh, a repetitive, regular resource base to live off of, and forests provide that. So the, the overwhelming majority of uh, species diversity on Earth is congregated in forests and also um, the diversity itself, the density of it is greater in forests. And when you look at the planet, uh, tropical rainforests have this incredible uh, consistency of climate, and they also have this incredible density of, of tree canopy. And so what that means is that these forests are not only the most biodiverse on our planet, but um, they're the most complex uh, in terms of their structures, uh, and they have these amazing massive trees. Uh, there are massive trees in other parts of the world, too, but um, tropical forests are the most um, carbon-dense ecosystems we have on land. So what that hails from is uh, this simple thing that we call photosynthesis, or um, trees making oxygen is the way we think of it. But when carbon dioxide passes through the air, a tree will hold on to all of the carbon and let about 80% of the oxygen back into the atmosphere. So we think of this as purifying the air. What the tree is doing is growing. And the trees in the tropics, because they have year-round um, precipitation and warmth, are better at sequestering carbon consistently, day after day after day. And so when you look at the way that carbon density is distributed on land, on our planet, the tropical forests have about 55% of all land-based carbon density. They also have two-thirds of all uh, biodiversity, roughly speaking from fresh, freshwater fish, um, which is uh, sort of unfathomable. There's, uh, there's one little statistic that says there can be as many freshwater fish species in a single pool of the Amazon as there are species in the entire Atlantic Ocean, fish species are, as there are on the Atlantic Ocean. It's just a dramatically diverse environment. And the same goes for all the other types of species we talked about. Uh, so this one solution of uh, protecting these ecosystems, these tropical forest ecosystems, radically benefits us um, at global scale in terms of these two big crises we have, which I'm going to tell you more about in a second, the extinction crisis and the climate crisis you hear so much about. So climate first, and just a couple of bullet points on climate. Uh, the first is everyone is familiar with the idea that we have yet to start really reducing global emissions. We're getting closer and closer. We're making a lot of progress. And I'll show you some good news about that in a second. But we're still in the emissions annually. Um, second bullet point of three is um, in 2007, the head of the whole uh, UN project of scientists called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, he said that if we don't um, stop increasing emissions at 2012, the end of 2011, we'll be headed into a worst-case scenario. And, you know... An, Obviously, weather in Texas has been really bad uh, in 2015. Um, 43 people died last weekend for the Christmas storms. Um, those deaths were from tornadoes and floods, and they happened basically December 23rd through December 29 in about six or seven states. Um, there was an article that came out yesterday, Saturday morning in the Statesman. 35,000 cattle died in snowdrifts in the Panhandle and uh, New Mexico. And that kind of loss um, represents much more than just the economics, obviously much more than the cattle. Um, one thing it represents is about half of Texas's dairies, Texas's best dairies are out of business apparently for a while. Um, and another thing it represents is a lot more animals, a lot more outdoor species, a lot more plants, a lot more of the ecosystem itself uh, is being stressed to the point of death, often. And we're, we're there, effectively. It's the, uh, the concept of climate change and a worst-case scenario and so forth is here now. So we need really fast-acting, globally impactful solutions. Um, one of the main drivers of 
climate change actually is burning tropical rainforests. So when you look at the IPCC's reports from 2007 and 2014, basically, these, all these levels change on an annual basis. But basically, on average, uh, burning up tropical forests for things like palm oil and beef cattle and soy and other types of development, those emissions are causing the, the, the third greatest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions uh, to the global greenhouse gas problem. So not only are we burning down our best land-based carbon sequestration resource, but we're also putting more emissions into the atmosphere, um, like in 2012, uh, the EU, that's the European Union, put um, about 10 to 12 percent of global greenhouse gas, gas emissions into the, the air that year, 2012. Um, tropical deforestation by fire was about 12 percent um, that year. We may have the same thing this year. There was a horrible, horrible outbreak uh, of fire in Indonesia this fall, um, which we can, I can show some of those slides if we need to. But um, this, this issue of burning up tropical forests is making our climate change problem worse on two levels. We're destroying our sequestration, our best sequestration, and we're destroying, uh, we're releasing emissions at scale that just make our problem that much worse. Ten, the, the estimates are anywhere from 8 to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions in a given year of the last 30 years have come from tropical deforestation. Okay, so some good news here. We have the encyclical from uh, Pope Francis. And um, I think that this, um, the focus on, again, community being what the sacred space is sort of about here as opposed to a deity, uh, I'm so fascinated by. And I think um, you know, the reason for that, as I say, is community is going to be one of the ways we really turn the ship here. Uh, on these big challenges. Pope Francis's document is also a, sort of an ethical and a spiritual authority, and it's the first uh, sort of moment in history where the leading religious figure has stood up and said things like, uh, we need an integrated approach to combating poverty and protecting nature. Uh, as it turns out, the solution uh, for the tropical rainforest it also benefits indigenous people and uncontacted tribes. And we'll get into that in a moment as well, but that's one of the the key uh, table legs of how you protect forests in the long term is to return it back to its wild state and uh, develop relationships with the indigenous people there where they are not forced into your paradigm. And you're you're creating a collaborative stewardship-based economy, which is really what we need right now. We need to start talking about those kinds of values, uh, stop being as extractive. Um, And another great thing that's happened is the Paris Climate Accord. Um, which I feel like Alan, Dale, and I should. Um, but the Paris Climate Accord is really, really significant because it's now um, the first moment in human history that there's been a, a global governmental accord on these values that say um, humanity has the potential to accidentally destroy itself um, by destroying the environment. And so we need to work faster than we have been. Uh, the first point here. Um, keep warming below two degrees Celsius. There's a there's a really important narrative that I wish I had more time for, but basically the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming mark is the cutoff for African uh, delegations, African nations, and the reason is because they say that the science clearly shows that if we go above one and a half, we've already gone to one. If we go to one and a half degrees Celsius, they call that genocidal warning, warming that will lose hundreds of millions of people, particularly in Africa. So the the emphasis on 1.5, it's not about business, it's not about environment, it's not about, it's about genocidal warming. And that's why that is finally in the conversation, because there is empathy for this idea that we don't want to destroy ourselves. We want to build a constructive future. And we're starting to have this kind of structure ethically at a global level. Uh, The second piece, um, preserve and protect uh, forests and, and other ecosystems and use them as an asset in the climate solution. This is gratifying to me because I've been talking about this stuff for about a year, uh, and suddenly it shows up. Um, but I really believe that, that maybe the key thing for me to say today to everyone here and, and anyone watching is we need to be investing in not just technology, but also nature, equally in nature right now. That's, that's one of the strategies that will really move us forward rapidly. 
And you'll see in a moment the urgency of doing that couldn't be greater. Um, the idea of continuously improving is in the structure of this Paris Climate Accord. So that's brilliant. That basically means um, that we are going to expand the renewables industry as fast as possible and contract emissions as fast as possible and keep up in goals. And then, lastly, protecting the poor. And again, um, there's an aspect to the solution that is about empowering the poor, uh, or what we call the poor, people who don't rely on Western commerce. Um, there's also uh, the reality that our wealthy nation, you know, I was lucky enough to be born in Austin in 1971, and I've had this great quality of life that I was entitled to or I never asked for. Um, but people in other nations in the world, such as in uh, places in Africa that might be flooded or might have drought uh, that's insurmountable, those people need our help. They need our help to protect their ecosystems, their ways of life, uh, and to prepare them and provide them with economic tools to get through the kinds of things that we're seeing now, really about on a quarterly basis, I think in 2015, nearly. We had three major deadly storms uh, in 2015 right in this area, uh, two in Wimberley and one in Garland, Texas. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of thinking about our membership at a global level uh, and, and uh, with the rest of humanity. Um, more good news here. This is a chart showing how rapidly wind has grown uh, since 1996 and it ends in 2014. So it's you know, more than 100% growth uh, in, in 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I'm not sure, Al, or someone might know what this portion of global electricity is being generated by wind, but the fact is that um, renewables are here. They're proven. They've worked, yes, because of some government help. They've worked more so because the people have led, and they have demanded these great technologies that solve environmental problems and create economic assets for them, and, and the, you've seen, you're seeing incredible growth in renewables, and it's consistent, and it's going straight up. Uh, so this is solar worldwide. Uh, in the last 10 years, and we went from, I don't know, will it work, to get in, get in as fast as you can. Um, and if we have more time, we'll talk about Germany and things like that. Uh, same thing with electric vehicles. It's also really good news. And, um, you know, the, one of the cool things to look forward to in the world is the 2017 Tesla that will be $35,000, and we'll all have access to the first affordable luxury car. And they say they're the best cars ever built in the world. They're also zero emissions cars. Um, and then lastly, energy storage has been a thing that back in 2010, when I was uh, really involved at City Hall, you know, they were just like, well, there's no energy storage. I don't know how we can possibly go renewable because renewables, uh, you know, generate electricity when the wind blows or the sun shines. Um, but the fact of the matter is we're, we're essentially there as well with um, battery packs and, and large-scale energy, utility-scale energy storage. We have those products. Um, this Tesla Power Pack product is open intellectual property, so that the concept for the company there is that they can't scale up fast enough to meet what is the environmental demand globally, so they're trying to empower companies in other countries to build these products to help us all. Um, okay, the only thing that really hasn't improved in terms of things that are generating emissions is uh, deforestation. Okay. So, this is an area... Uh, kind of hard to see on the slide exposure, but you get the general idea. Um, this is twice the size of Texas, and then you can see it's just a 20-year period. These forests, um, these tropical rainforests that ultimately are the ecosystems that I'm promoting as we need your help today. Um, these ecosystems have a, a lineage that goes back about 100 million years, and our species is only about 100,000 years old. And when you think through, like, um, how the, uh, you know, humans emerged and so forth, and, and the, the amount of diversity that's in uh, tropical forests from the soil level on up, and where primates congregate and primates are from, and we're descended from primates, tropical forests are part of our story. Um, and the, the global loss is, unfortunately, catastrophic relative to uh, when I was born in 1971. So... In the last 45 years, what I've circled is um, where you should look below. So if we start with the Atlantic um, tropical forest in Brazil, it's been reduced about 
um, in the last 45 years or so. If you go over to the Western Congo in Africa, point with my other arm, that's been reduced more than 50 percent. Madagascar, this little island, uh, more than 90 percent. And then these forests um, are the most biodiverse subtropical and temperate forests, uh, essentially India to China, and they've been just completely fragmented. That's what you saw the larger slide, a piece of that earlier. Indonesia uh, and Papua New Guinea, this area of south of tropical Asian islands, um, has lost, at this point, probably 75% of the Indonesian uh, and Malaysian forests. And then back over to Central America, it's been tremendously fragmented, and the Amazon's been reduced about uh, 25%. So we lose an acre a second to deforestation right now. That rate of loss has been happening uh, since I... I judging by all the mappings I see, since at least 1980, uh, maybe since 1970. And we've lost um, something like 2.2 million square miles between 1970 and 2010. Um, it's just a, uh, from a climate change perspective, you know, climate change encourages us to think about the globe as a, a whole ecosystem itself. Uh, and from a climate change perspective, we've taken out, um, again, this, this exceptional life support system just in terms of the way it mitigates the, the sun's heat island effect on the planet, the way it sequesters carbon, um, the way it regulates precipitation, um, and the way it regulates uh, storm systems and so forth because of its mass. We've reduced it from occupying 14% of lands in about 1970 to now 6 or less percent of global lands. Um, but when we protect them, there are these beautiful, beautiful things. And the vision here is about not just saving the last forests on Earth. It's about um, the values of restoring and reconnecting these forests also. And, you know, thinking globally about how humanity can um, start to live uh, in a more integrated way with these global ecosystems that we need. Um, so this is a project that we helped uh, via First Baptist Church and uh, Bob and Patty at, at St. Andrew's Presbyterian. Uh, and it was a little wildlife corridor that connected two larger uh, preserves. So this, this species in particular uh, was critically endangered. It basically lived in one of those preserves, and its, its uh, resource base got doubled. These orchids grow only in this region and one other in the world. <coughs> um, and this little guy, who's the, clearly the Ewok model, um, was just discovered a few years ago. Um, but all of these species and hundreds or thousands or even millions more, if you think about the soil components, um, now are protected to continue existing, continue providing us with these ecological life support system uh, services. Here's one uh, in Guatemala, and this was going to be, uh, I'll go into more detail in on a particular project, but I just want to give you a feel for some of these things. Um, these are some of the species protected here. A coffee company in Japan was going to come in and just destroy the forest and put in coffee bean plants, put in a plantation. Uh, and there is an extremely integrated relationship between the indigenous people and their forest and the lifestyle and the culture and all these things. So um, one of the groups here in Austin called Global Wildlife Conservation uh, worked to protect this place. And I should clarify, actually, my whole role here with biointegrity is to educate and to, um, again, according to the mission statement, um, help the world's best solutions, both global environmental solutions, succeed as fast as possible. So I'm a fundraiser for those, those causes. That's why, if you have the takeaway, there's a project you can donate to on the back, uh, which we won't push that message today. But um, I will push the, the impact of that, the, the benefits of, of that, uh, so you understand this opportunity. The biodiversity crisis, or the extinction crisis, um, has some, some pretty heavy factoids. Uh, so between, according to a, a, an annual study, or an ongoing annual study conducted by World Wildlife Fund, between 1970 and 2010, more than half of the world's wildlife was just destroyed. Um, and, a, and a different study came out um, in June that said, if we just do the math, the simple math, one plus one is two, and don't factor in climate change or any other of the kind of challenges that we see right now, 75% of all animal life on Earth will be extinct within the next three human lifetimes. So <clears throat> the time to act is, is literally now. Um, I think it's fair and realistic to say we have five years 
to keep this problem from getting even worse um, relative to our quality of life. Um, and so these are short-term kind of projections on how fast things are disappearing. Um, again, the rate of loss in these ecosystems and the fragmentation of these ecosystems, uh, particularly in the tropics, is what's driving the extinction crisis. And um, people want to know literally, you know, why is all this bad stuff happening? Um, it's a simple answer. You know, again, our species is about 100,000 years old. It took us about that long, 100,000 years, to get to a billion people, and then just 123 years to get to 2 billion. Uh, and I know people who were around when we hit 2 billion. They're still alive. And now we're at uh, 7 and 0.35, maybe 7.36 billion. We add over 100 million extra people, really closer to 150 million extra people, to Earth right now every year. Um, so we're just increasing demands. We're destroying habitat. Uh, the number one driver of this problem is habitat destruction and fragmentation, where you're just whittling down the ability of species to uh, survive. Uh, so by protecting these ecosystems and reconnecting these ecosystems, we can start to reverse that process, start to help nature refill the cup. Um, the extinctions are severe. We lose um, 100 to 200, the official kind of talk now, is 100 to 200 species go extinct every day. Uh, and that's driven by um, tropical deforestation. Because we're losing an acre a second, that adds up to 80,000 to 100,000 acres every day that just go. And um, the, the, the losses, of course, are across the entire spectrum, from the microbiota to the macro that you're seeing here. Um, one interesting thing, uh, I think, oh, that didn't show up very well, but it's a beautiful slide. Um, so I'm sorry you can't see it. It's very colorful, and basically it's telling the story of life, and that about three and a half billion years ago, somewhere in that range, um, the first cells emerged in, in water, and it took them uh, quite a while to turn into life um, more complicated than that. Then about 600 million years ago, um, the first land-based species started to emerge. And uh, the first forests were maybe 400 million years ago. Uh, the planet was a hot, more tropical place back then. All these things have happened. Uh, there's been various extinction events along the way. But we're the, now the result. This is not, this doesn't have the thing, but we're here on this, this spectrum. So, um, again, the, the ecosystems themselves, they mean everything to us. Um, so this, this, uh, this one solution, this protecting tropical rainforest, has true global impact. And I'm going to get into that with a couple of sh much shorter presentations. This is the, the long-winded one. Um, but by protecting um, of all the ecosystems we have, by protecting tropical forests first, we're not only protecting the greatest density of biodiversity per dollar invested that we can uh, at a time when they're disappearing faster than they've ever disappeared, in not just human history, but in the last 65 million years, uh, and possibly longer. Um, but we're also protecting uh, ourselves from making the climate change problem much worse. So we can, we can literally reduce uh, potential global emissions by thousands of tons or hundreds of thousands of tons by simple donations to these conservation projects that are globally strategic and protect species. Um, and let me just jump over to that one, since... That's a good bridge. Um, how's everybody doing? No one's falling asleep? Okay, let's look at uh, the sort of in, uh, economic rationale on these things. So, <laughs> the smallest mocha at Starbucks is uh, $3.99, uh, and the project that's on the back of your takeaway is in Sumatra, uh, and it's $3.41 per acre. So for less than the smallest smoke at Starbucks, you can protect an acre of an ecosystem. That means, again, uh, everything to us uh, in terms of um, the oxygen system. About 20% uh, of the global oxygen cycle is generated by this very small ecosystem now, the, the tropical rainforest. Um, and again, the values on carbon sequestration and so forth. Um, this particular project has two indigenous communities that will benefit from the way the project is designed. Um, and the, the global integrity of ecosystems will begin to be restored as well with, with this approach. So here's, here's the options you know, of, of things we can do today. 
Uh, and I also just want to share comparison for, for scale's sake. Um, again, I think um, we need to invest in technology and nature equally. And the good news is that the investments in nature are tremendously more impactful to sort of the metrics that I started with as an environmentalist. So um, $100 put into greening up your home, which is what I used to do with my eco store. I know this area extremely well. And I was very excited about helping people eliminate one ton of CO2 10 years ago. But changing your light bulbs and those kinds of things, the net impact in terms of the metrics is about four tons of CO2 removed over a 20-year period or something like that. Um, a windmill or a solar panel can't do much for $100, um, but they're very important. I'm not trying to downplay them or anything. I'm just saying comparatively. Uh, and then this represents uh, a product that we environmentalists love called carbon offsets. Um, and so for $100, you get about eight tons offset through any of a couple of mechanisms. But for $100, where it's $3.41 an acre in a, a region of the world that has 100 million year old forests that are being set on fire right now, um, and you can help increase the, the federal protection with this particular project and the conservation staffing and the relationship with the indigenous people there. So you have three layers of protection for this place. Um, that particular value, uh, there's over 200 tons of stored uh, carbon dioxide per acre. And we'll get back to that in a second, too. That particular value um, of uh, 29 acres keeps about 5,800 tons of greenhouse gases out of the, atmospheres off the, off the atmosphere off the bat and then continues to sequester carbon. And then that same $100 um, will protect species in this place. It's part of a larger project. Um, and again, this is the one on the back of your takeaway. Uh, and then this place, again, helps protect um, two indigenous communities, which is a, a very real and significant sincere problem. Um, obviously, we've, you know, the Tonka War were the indigenous people here. But, whoops. Um, and, you know, we have a culture of erasing that, and that needs to stop as well. Uh, and there's millions of brilliant reasons for us developing a more compassionate globalization, more stewardship-oriented capitalism, and so forth. So this is how in the investments kind of compare. And this is why I started Biointegrity, because I saw this, and I said, Everybody should know this, especially people like Al Braden, who care so passionately about eliminating emissions, protecting the future of life on, on Earth. You know, this is the winning strategy um, to move fast. And then let me show you a little bit quickly about this beautiful project, and then we'll do Q&A. Yeah, good. Um, one second here. Okay, so again, there's a project on the back of your sheet that's in Sumatra. Um, Sumatra is in Indonesia. And this project is one of the services Biointegrity is providing, which it's not a nonprofit yet. It will probably become a nonprofit. So if you want to donate to this project um, and make it tax deductible, give through Rainforest Trust, one of the Biointegrity partners. And I'll tell you more about them in a moment. Um, so Indonesia is this fascinating place. Um, Biologically, it's, it's the third, in terms of the countries of the world, it's got the third greatest density of diversity in, in its forests. Um, I believe probably the greatest density of diversity overall because the, the concentration of coral reefs around Indonesia is tremendous. There are 18,000 islands or so in that nation. Um, they're also oftentimes the third greatest emitter of greenhouse gases. This may be another year for that. Um, and they are um, essentially number one in... Uh, eliminating their prehistoric forests um, relative to the, the most important forests we have left. Um, so this is showing the increasing rate uh, of deforestation there between 2000 and 2012. Um, so here's where we, are, where we are in the world. And this is Sumatra. This is, sorry, this is where the project is. And then this is showing... Um, how rapidly deforestation has affected Sumatra. So it starts out in 1950, and it's uh, basically rubber plantations for tires and things. And then the 60s, some rice plantations. And then in about 89, the palm oil businesses start to consume all the forest on the island. So at least 75% of the old growth forests have been consumed between 1950 and 2010. 
Um, and, you know, that's the urgency piece of this, is that the, any, any delay to help a protected area means that it will likely disappear. Um, that we, we could lose all tropical forests on Earth um, in another 40 years or less uh, at the rate we're going. Uh, so you can help prevent that from happening and, and again, help turn the ship. Um, there's also, in this particular project, by supporting it, you're, you're helping um, three extremely beautiful, uh, charismatic, um, endangered species that are at the last stop, stop before extinction. So there are about 400 of these Sumatran tigers. Uh, this is a critically endangered species, in other word, words. And 10% um, of them live here. 10% of the mature adults live here in this particular preserve. There's also um, our, basically our aunts and uncles, the orangutans. Uh, and they are being reintroduced here uh, with a, this wonderful project that's helping to reconnect the forests, excuse me, of Indonesia, um, which I'll tell you about them as well a little bit. And then finally, the, the third critically endangered species here that you can help save uh, from extinction is the Sumatran uh, elephant. And so this is from the site. And there are 11 elephants together there. This, they're the very social animal. They're very uh, emotionally intelligent animals. That, you know, they're, they say, they talk about uh, elephants as the guardians of the forest, that they're the ones that really keep the ecosystem together uh, at the end of the day. And they're just essential to so many things, our, our spiritual lives, our, our relationships with our children, you know. But, um, so they're here as well. And then um, this is a quick, almost quick enough, not quite quick enough, uh, montage of some of the other species there. Um, really, really amazing stuff um, that, you know, we can't reproduce. These are irreplaceable ecological things. And... So that's some of the numbers there, over 190 bird species, um, 1,500 plant species, uh, et cetera. There's also these two indigenous groups we talked about. So the Orang Rimba people, that basically means forest people. Um, orangutan means uh, forest man or something like that. Orang Rimba is forest people. And uh, they live there full time. They still uh, rely on the forest 100%. Uh, the Talong Mamak people have a more distributed um, a culture around the region, um, but some of them live there and they still use it for um, spiritual and, and ceremonial aspects, community celebrations and so forth. Um, this is really fast, what it sort of looks like um, and where we are in the world. The partnerships on this particular project and the partnerships, the, the projects that Biointegrity is recommending um, are always really strong. And so there, there are multiple criteria to the biointegrity kind of recommendation process. And so the partners here, the, the federal government um, of Indonesia created a new uh, model, a new legal model, so that this place will be protected and restored. And this will be the first one of those projects. So it's been collaboration between World Wildlife Fund and some other groups. Um, and then the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, that usually makes people go, oh, now i got to do it. Um, uh, let's see and Rainforest Trust and Orangutan Project, and many others uh, also, the local groups. Um, Rainforest Trust, super briefly, is, is my partner, uh, Biointegrity's partner. Um, they're the, the most uh, outstanding, I think, of the uh, rainforest conservation groups that are small, independent, and super uh, efficient. So they're four-star rated with Charity Navigator, and um, on average, about 93% of what's donated goes straight to the project. Um, and now they've actually protected 11 million acres. A friend of mine made that slide um, several months ago, and they, they just added about 3.5 million acres to that number. Uh, and biointegrity donors have protected uh, over 37,000 acres in the first year, so that's pretty cool. Um, the Orangutan Project is this Australian group that's uh, managing the park um, already with wildlife patrols and, and so forth, uh, fire patrols, um, and they're part of this network of other Australian groups, and the way conservation is organized um, oftentimes is around the animal, the, the, the most attractive species. And you can talk to somebody who likes bears about saving bears, but what you're really doing is saving bear habitat, which really means you're saving an ecosystem, uh, which is, again, back to the sort of bigger picture stuff. Uh, and so this network of different species and stuff, they, they're all in Indonesia, and you know, there's a variety of Australian zoos and other Australian conservation groups. Uh, and they're here. They're already running the project. They're here in this place, rather. 
Um, I love that photo. That's of the place. So the plan, super fast, is uh, these two groups that I've mentioned, Rainforest Trust and Orangutan Project, are sort of managing um, the uh, ecosystem restoration concession is what the government created. So there are timber concessions, and basically you get a lease, and you can cut down as many trees as you want. Or you get a palm concession, and you can destroy the environment and put in a palm plantation. The 100 million forest, 100 million year old forest just goes. Uh, but this is the opposite of that. This is saying we're going to protect this place for uh, ecosystem purposes and restoration purposes of that ecosystem. This is ideal. They have uh, three concessions in a row, so the 20 years each. And during that 60-year period, they'll transfer ownership of the park uh, into national park status. So it has even more protections. Uh, and CAHUS um, is a, uh, the economic initiative, the sort of social justice piece, where they're working with Orang, the Orang Rimba and the Talang Mamak peoples to create crafts and, and other types of ecotourism and stuff so they can have uh, income coming into that uh, ecosystem that doesn't hamper the ecosystem or, or alter the ecosystem in any way. Uh, allows it to restore moral wildlife protection unit patrols. And again, uh, the, the long-term game here is to move this into national park status. Uh, and the carbon values, I think I'm long on time here. Yes? Okay, good. Well, this is the very end, actually, of the, the talky stuff. So... Um, the carbon values here, again, are immense. Um, these, are, these are some of the most carbon-dense forests on Earth, um, upwards of, in some cases, 400 to 800 tons in a single acre, just in above-ground biomass, just in these trees. So um, when a tree intakes all that carbon, uh, it holds on to it to make its biomass. 50% of a tree is just carbon. And if a tree is burned, then that carbon is released and it rebonds with uh, oxygen to make CO2. And that's why we have these horrendous greenhouse gas emissions coming from destroying these places. Um, we round way down uh, on this one because this is a restoration project. So some of the old growth is there and, and uh, some is not. Um, and then there's a sequestration value as well. And last but not least, uh, my partner, rainforesttrust.org, so that's on your sheet. And you can prevent fires and pollution. Thank you so much for listening to me talk. And I, I really uh, ask for your help with this project, and I'm available to talk after, and let's do some Q&A. So let's take our first question. Felicia? If I wanted to put, if I wanted to put your website on my Facebook page, for example, could you tell me how does your website compare to the slides you're showing? What does your website have on it? The website is more general right now. Um, it's basically the it's kind of realization that there, there is a solution here to these big problems. And we're working hard to move forward the re renewable technologies and so forth, but an immediate solution to the extinction crisis is to protect these places. So, and then the, the carbon benefits or the, green, the climate change benefits to us on that are immense, especially per dollar invested. But the website doesn't show that as easily as this does. So there's a lot of information there. The Facebook page is kind of telling that story over and over as well. It's Facebook, you know, forward slash biointegrity. Uh, and the website's biointegrity.net. There'll be a new website, but it may be, we're probably going to transition to nonprofit in the next couple of months. And so there's some things that will take place. Um, and the website's a little more geared towards these one-on-one -on -one talks than public talks. So please share it, but it, it may not do what you want it to do based on the presentation. I'm hoping this video comes out good. Put that up there. We have a question from Margaret Borden. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> most of my questions have to do with sustainability. What is it the money is enabling you to do that you can't do without money? Are you buying this in this private land? Is it is it uh, getting the people in to have it happen? The second part is is uh, you talked a little bit about these federal laws. Uh, what protection is it that's going to stay the way you hope? And is there an ultimate size of this forest that is being aimed for that makes all of this sustainable? I love the last question. I think that's what, how we need to be thinking culturally. I think, you know, part of this, the sort of reason for this presentation is this is really easy stuff to understand because you can see it in, on a map. And uh, it's the kind of thing that can spread quickly, like the concept of gravity, for instance. Um, so I think we should be talking then about how much forest do we want to restore. 
We know that 8,000 years ago there were 6 trillion trees on Earth, and now there's 3.2. Most of that loss has happened because of tropical deforestation in the last 45 years, is, is my guess, based on what I know. So maybe we want to have twice as much forest as we have now uh, to stabilize our climate and improve our quality of life. Um, in terms of the, how the money is, is used in these projects, the main concept is that, you know, business is moving faster than government and poverty is moving faster than government to destroy these places. So what we're doing with biointegrity is helping, you know, uh, global conservation succeed as fast as possible because global conservation is the fastest way to protect places before they disappear. And it's really that simple. Uh, and then how the money is used on a per project basis depends on the country, depends on the arrangement of the project, and, of course, on the conditions of the scale of the project and, and a lot of other factors. Um, in every case, really, the ultimate goal is to keep the indigenous people there um, and just, you know, leave them to their culture um, and empower them with ways to connect to Western commerce that makes sense for them and the place. Um, in terms of the uh, ultimate ownership of the land, it's about turning these places into national parks. Um, that's the best model we have right now. In terms of how long that lasts, it depends. You know, there's, there are no guarantees. If, if uh, Trump is in the White House, you know, then we already know that Yellowstone is on the chopping block, uh, which is something that we were talking about a year ago when Congress flipped, um, and it happened within two months. You know, they were talking about privatizing Yellowstone. And so there are conflicting views on that and all those things. But um, these projects are the best sort of hopes, you know, to borrow the, the Star Wars metaphor, um, in terms of moving rapidly to make a big difference. And uh, Rainforest Trust has a great record with their projects, and the other partners we recommend do as well. And, and the last thing I'll say on that is that those people are, they're for real. You know, they're, it's like Indiana Jones and stuff. You're seeing people that are just heroic in their daily work life. Uh, they, they travel the world and do these amazing things. So they're committed. They're there forever. We have a little under five minutes, I think. Would you stand and say your name, please? And raise your hands high so I can see you. Um, Bob Hendricks, I've read that some scientists are concerned about a tipping point of the Amazon rainforest drying up and burning up. Do you have any insights or comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in terms of the extinction crisis, we're over the tipping point. That's why I say the next five years are critical. One of the foundational goals for biointegrity is to try and, well, is to help end tropical deforestation by 2020, you know, in the next four years. And from where I stand right now, that's, a, that's an enormous goal. But um, stopping the deforestation is the first thing to prevent that from happening. What happens when the forests are fragmented, whether it's a highway or an oil pad or a big palm oil plantation or a Kentucky Fried Chicken or whatever, um, it alters the interconnectivity of this inter interdependence, which is another value of this community that I think is so just awesome, the interdependence of that ecosystem. And that's why they start to uh, lose their um, seasonal weather patterns and drought happens. So we're going to lose more things as we move forward for a while because there's not enough people who know and care and who understand the power of a simple $5 donation or a $100 you know, donation, a $5,000 donation, whatever it is. Um, but the only, there's, there's two choices. There's letting that happen, which will certainly, we've already seen a lot of it. There's been drought in the Amazon the last two years. There's been natural wildfire outbreak in the Amazon in the last five or so years at a huge scale because of this fragmentation. Uh, and the only choices are let that get worse or start fixing that. We have a question here. Would you stand and say your name, please? Hi, Al Brayton. Hi, Chris. Uh, hey. Thank you for doing this incredibly important work and sort of helping us to see over the horizon. Uh, it brings up a lot of questions, but the, well, the one question that was just spoken of, it really depends on the strength of the local governments. I mean, if, you, if we put money into a system, how, how viable is that and how long term is it viable? And I'm just, what I wanted to ask is, do you see influence of the Paris Agreement giving some of these governments and regions more backbone to really protect over a longer period of time. Yeah, the, uh, um, both in the sort of power of the emotional meaning of that accord um, and 
but also uh, it, it's sort of just changed the, the foundation or the I think the, the level one uh, awareness in, within government. And you know, Obama made this great wisecrack. Um, and I assume this will be funny here, but if it's not, I apologize. But I thought it was it was worth it's worth repeating, which is the only political party in the developed world. The only big political party in the developed world that denies climate change anymore is just the American Republican Party, and and I have a lot of uh, Republican family and friends, and you know I feel like they're being manipulated uh, on a lot of things, um, and so I think small government, you know, cities led. Austin was a huge part of the Paris Climate Accord uh, succeeding. Uh, cities have led, and counties are, are able to do things that state and federal governments are not as nimble at uh, in terms of enacting policy and stuff. So I think the, the, the feeling of this is the right thing to do now, both in our culture, our, our structural culture of what we do in municipalities, um, but also in our life's work, you know, as people who are trying to serve society through a municipal job or a, uh, a local governance job, I think that those two things are going to work together more and more. In addition to, you know, people now acting those things out, investments. Do you want to just take a moment to make a closing statement, Chris? Sure. I, I was. I don't really have a, a big closing statement, but um, um, okay. Well, on the takeaway sheet, there's only five uh, key values um, that our most biodiverse ecosystems are in the tropics. Um, but I hope, and, and so forth. I hope that you kind of consider these values in the larger context of what we're talking about. That we have a, a, a global downward slide on the extinction crisis. That. Um, the, the most effective way to stop that is to predict these places. Um, and then also the, the other big picture value is that if, um, if you go through, and they're listed on the, the flyer, if you go through the life support systems that are generated by tropical forests, they are arguably our most um, valuable to humanity ecosystems. Um, and if you consider the rate of, of loss uh, and the uh, amount that we have left, um, you know, I hope, hope that you will get involved and help in this story become a big success story in the future. And thank you again, and, and yeah. thanks for the inspiration. Thank you for telling us what we can be doing and for your important work.